Welcome to today's program titled Managing 2020 Labor Relations Concerns. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those of you who are logged into the web presentation, you're encouraged to submit questions throughout the conference by typing them into the text box on your screen. For those interested in obtaining CLE credit for this webinar, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation that will be required on the CLE attendance affirmation form. Please write this code down. It will not be reread and it is required for CLE credit. Copies of the webinar recording and materials will be distributed to attendees in the days following the seminar using the email address that you use to register. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Glenn Smith. Glenn, you may begin. Thank you very much. Um, thanks and welcome, everybody. We are very happy to host you today. Our program is going to run from 12.30 to approximately 2. <clears throat> We're hoping to leave about 15 minutes for questions. We do welcome you to send them along at any time. And uh, where we can, we'll work them into the presentation. Um, if not, we'll try to address them at the end of the call. We're starting with our legal disclaimer slide, which I won't read to you, but um, it's, it's there and certainly required by CIFIRS. Taking a quick look at the agenda, here's what we intend to cover today. We want to take a look at the changing landscape that's out there. We want to take a look at some surveys and what people are saying, what employees are saying, and what we need to address when we get back to work or as we continue to get back to work. Um, we're going to look at some recent NLRB developments. We're going to go into um, organizing and protected activity. This is especially focused on those employers who are non-union at present. And then we're going to take a look at our unionized uh, uh, workforces where we have bargaining and other interests. We're going to follow that up again with some question and answer. As far as who's going to be speaking today, um, I'll introduce myself first. Um, I'm the chair of the practice group for labor management relations. In terms of uh, my history, it's been 30 years of practicing almost exclusively traditional labor law. Um, I do have about six years in-house experience, too, where I was general counsel for two public companies. But in terms of the industries I handle, I do a lot of, in the refining space, health, long-term care. Um, I've done a lot of retail historically, especially grocery. That was part of my in-house experience and prior to that. I've done a lot of transport and logistics, casino work, and I also have a small private golf club practice that I do as well, which is kind of unrelated to this, although in some instances related. Also, we have Molly Gable, who is... Uh, in our Seattle office. Molly has returned recently to CIFARTH after an in-house stint as well. Um, Molly's a, a vice chair in our practice group, a great addition to um, our resources out west and across the firm. Her focus has been largely air, RLA type things, travel, hospitality, transportation, and logistics industries. We're really lucky to have her back. Um, she was in the Chicago office originally um, when she worked at CIFARTH and now out west. We have Kylan Kershaw, who is in Atlanta. She's also a vice chair of the practice group. Uh, Kylan and I work together at a prior firm, too. Um, she's another tremendous labor lawyer who spends really almost all her time doing labor law. She focuses on uh, utilities industries, manufacturing, health care, print and broadcast, um, and uh, transportation, logistics, and retail. And finally, we have Brian Stolzenbach. Brian was the vice chair of the practice group uh, until he helped hand it over to us this past year. Uh, Brian's out of our Chicago office, uh, another uh, one of our practitioners who spends a really large chunk of his time doing traditional labor work. Brian has a ton of experience in construction, hospitality, health care, energy, manufacturing, retail, and transportation and logistics. So sorry for those introductions. Hopefully I didn't take too long to do them. But what prompts this uh, webinar today is, is part of our changing landscape. Um, and, and here's a quick snapshot of it as far as, you know, just to try to put it on one slide. In 2019, we're dealing with historically low unemployment, an economy that was really expanding and rapidly expanding a news cycle that was focused almost entirely on Russia and impeachment, 
and we were dealing with the National Labor Relations Board that had four members issuing multiple decisions, continuing to pare back really the law to the to the pre-Obama board era um, and uh, make refinements to that as well. As you take a look at 2020, um, and if anybody predicted this, please let us know. We'd, we'd be happy to have somebody who uh, who, who has such prog prog uh, <coughs> such skills to um, predict what's going to happen. But um, in 2020, we're now we're at near record high employment. Our economy has essentially collapsed in in a number of sectors, and hopefully, it's going to re return. Obviously, the news cycle has been. Um, really inundated with two main themes, the COVID-19 and also racial and social justice. And we have an NLRB that's down to three members, and by the end of the summer, we'll be down to two. While they're still evolving the law in some instances, at, at some point we have to assume that it is going to just grind to a halt. That kind of sets us up for the survey that we wanted to go into. Yeah, so just to start this off, um, the first th three slides of this survey are um, the survey results of a Qualtrics study done um, at the beginning of May, right as employers were really starting to think about returning um, employees to the workplace. And uh, one of our partners in Washington, D.C., Brian O'Keefe, found this. And some of the statistics are pretty interesting, and they foreshadow a little bit um, what is going to come up or has been coming up and bargaining and organizing. So on this slide, you'll see an overwhelming majority of employees want basic safety um, measures at work, things like hand sanitizer, the ability to wear a mask, be social distanced. So these are things that are important to employees. Um, and as we discussed throughout this presentation, they are items that um, are leading to organizing activity potentially, but also on bargaining. Here on this slide, um, there is you know, a, a significant minority of employees um, that want more intrusive measures taken, things like temperature checks, um, you know, being allowed to skip work um, if, they, if they feel like they need to just stay safe. On this slide, the Qualtrics survey shows that employer employees are also wanting um, their coworkers to behave in certain ways in the workplace. And what that really means for us, um, you know, when we're advising employers, it often will mean the implementation of certain rules during this time. So requiring employees to wear masks, requiring employees or placing them far enough apart so that they can engage in social distancing. Also, interest, I found this interesting uh, a lot, want explicit no handshake and no hugs policies. Um, again, on this slide, a more significant uh, minority of employees um, also are looking for rules around break rooms, um, you know, what can and can't be done, especially around communal food. Um, there are some pretty serious restrictions on anybody who's traveled to self-quarantine before they come back to work. Um, and then employees who employees are wanting their employers to bring people back in phases, a significant minority of them. So that kind of gives a little bit of a, a lay of the land of what employees are are looking for um, from that Qualtrics survey. And I don't know um, if it matters all that much, but Qualtrics is a large data, data analytics company that crunches numbers for a lot of um, the Fortune 500 larger employers. I think I'm moving it over to turning it over to Kylan. Thanks, Molly. So going on to the next slide, um, this looks at uh, serving men and women about what entity is they view as most responsible for ensuring that as Americans start to return to normal activities, you know, who's responsible for preventing them from catching COVID-19. Um, somewhat unsurprisingly, both groups basically assigned the largest portion of responsibility to the government, uh, both federal and local combined, um, as well as, you know, oneself. Uh, 
different entities that provide products, consumer-facing places, uh, a small percentage indicated schools, and an even smaller percentage, so 6% of females who responded and 3% of males who responded viewed the employer as being most responsible for their safety. Uh, the caveat to this being that when this was taken, uh, I think it's fair to say that a lot of individuals were not coming into work at, at that time. And so I think we may see an increase in individuals who view the employer as taking more and more responsibility for their safety as more and more people return to work. And along those lines, you know, the types of precautions that employees are, are hoping to see uh, employers take as they return to work, it sort of varies across the board. There isn't any one specific thing that, you know, was significantly higher than the others. Um, I will note one thing that's not on the slide is the use of masks. Um, I, I would anticipate that that is probably a higher number than the accommodations that are listed here, um, which include things like plexiglass dividers, sneeze guards, um, you know, frequent cleaning, temperature checks, social distancing, sanitizer, you know, hygiene, you know, protocols and reminders, you know, throughout. 13% uh, uh, said that they would like to see entry point nasal swabbing. I, you know, I don't think that that's something that we'll see anyone doing, but, but we'll see how it goes, I suppose. And then in terms of what people are thinking, you know, about what they're willing to do now versus what they were willing to do a few months ago, there were some surprising answers here. Um, I know everyone doing this webinar was shocked to see that 66% of respondents said they would be willing to take a cruise as of May 20th, um, as well as 60% said they would attend a live sporting event, 52% said that they would stay at a hotel, 45% uh, said that they would fly commercially. Uh, the, the point of this being that if you look at the beginning numbers when this survey started in April, um, you know, the numbers were much lower. Only 39% of people said they were willing to go on a cruise, and only 34% of people said they were willing to attend a, a live sporting event. So we really just sort of view this as a, as a sign that, you know, things are slowly returning back to normal in terms of what individuals are willing to, to go out and do. Um, and, and so, you know, regardless of well, – actually, I'm, I'm going to let Glenn chime in for a second. Yeah, on that point, I mean, I do think it shows the trend up that uh, um, demand uh, is is going to start to return to the forefront for everyone. And, and as we do, it is going to start increasing the staffing, and especially as we get into some of the discussion later on about returning the unionized workforces back to work, it's going to bring, you know, right to the forefront what we're going to have to deal with in terms of how to get folks back, how to stage them getting back, and those are some of the things we're going to deal with as we get into the presentation later on. Thanks, Glenn. So, you know, as Glenn mentioned, I mean, the return to work is happening. States have lifted stay-at-home stay orders in large part. Uh, we've seen a surprise gain in jobs um, in the month of May. Unemployment made a, you know, pretty remarkable downward adjustment last week. Uh, in the job numbers that were actually released this morning, there were 1.5 million uh, jobless claims, which again sounds like a high number in any normal environment, but it still represents an overall downward trend. And so, you know, just looking at the different industries, uh, leisure and hospitality was the one that seemed to gain the, the most, the highest number of, you know, return employment. So, okay. And one thing that we did want to point out, you know, we've seen quite a bit of you know, employers face concerns where employees are either refusing to return to work or delaying return to work because in returning to work, they'll actually face a pay cut uh, compared to the enhanced unemployment compensation that they are currently receiving. And so that is a challenge that we've seen some of our clients face. And you know, we also wanted to note that a lot of these industries, like the leisure and hospitality industry and, you know, construction, retail, 
um, a lot of these industries are ones that we would consider to be more highly unionized or subject to greater organizing risks in the first place. So it's just something to keep in mind as, as your employees, to the extent they aren't already returning to work, to the extent that they are returning. That's something to, to keep in mind. Um, and then really quickly before I turn it over to Brian, there have been, as Glenn mentioned, we're about to have a you know, only two-person board by the end of August, but they have taken some action. In the meantime, um, they promulgated, you know, issued new election rules. Interestingly, um, the court, D.C. Circuit, actually overturned uh, a significant chunk of, of what the proposed rules were, uh, including, you know, one of the things that was in the proposed rules were you know, the ability to give employers, you know, the right to go back to what they used to be able to do, basically, and litigate certain issues prior to an election, such as who should be in the bargaining unit, uh, supervisory status, who can actually vote. Um, that portion of the rule was, was overturned, as well as you know, increasing the length between the time of the filing and the petition and the date of the election, um, the increased timing for the employer to serve a voter list. Um, and other things, which we, we put them all on the slide. I don't want to you know, go through all of them. But, but the point being that the court held that these changes or these proposed changes were substantive in nature and that, therefore, the NLRB couldn't, didn't have the authority to issue this portion of the rules without going through the standard notice and comment period under the Administrative Procedure Act. That being said, uh, some of the rules and, and a lot of the rules did go into effect as of June 1st. Um, you know, we will note that the court did remand the entire set of rules to the board for reconsideration. Um, the board still announced that all unaffected rules would be implemented immediately, but, but we note that the entire rule as a whole, in our view, is still potentially subject to legal challenge. But as of now, you know, there, there are some significant changes for employers, and I think welcome changes including the fact that a hearing now is scheduled at least 14 days um, from the issuance of the notice of hearing as opposed to eight days. Um, it gives the employer increased time to, to post a notice of petition for election, um, you know, changes in the timeline requiring a, a statement of position. Um, I, I think a lot of employers were happy to see that you know, the, a petitioner now, not just the respondent, but a petitioner, also has to file a statement of position at least three business days before the hearing as opposed to just responding um, at the hearing to the other statement of position. And, and there are some other changes that you know, we view as positive to the extent that they can yeah, stick, for lack of a better word. And then the other piece before we turn into, over to organizing that we've seen quite a bit of, um, as I think most people on this call probably know, when the COVID crisis initially started, the NLRB paused uh, representation elections, basically saying, we're not gonna have elections while we try and figure out what's going on. And then there were challenges to the board's decision to resume elections, but they did anyway. So they, they did resume elections, and it's essentially at the discretion of each individual regional director in terms of how these elections are being conducted, when they're being conducted. Um, and employers, you know, at my clients, I've had several elections, they've, they've faced a lot of challenges in this regard because regions at this point are basically insisting on mail ballot elections. Um, you know, board agents aren't back in the office yet and they're not really willing to come in to do in-person elections and go on site. So these elections, are being conducted by mail ballot in situations where in a normal environment, they almost certainly would be in-person elections, which is obviously frustrating to the extent that that's not what you want to see happening. Um, and then with the mail ballot, you know, there's a lot of different challenges. I've specifically seen challenges where employees are not getting um, mail ballots in time because of the nature of you know, COVID, they've been more migratory, they've been moving around more, their addresses have changed more frequently, and it's, you know, caused a lot of difficulty. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind, and another reason if you can avoid an election altogether, you want to, is that, you know, just campaigning, the matter of campaigning and conducting a campaign for an employer right now, we, we've faced, we've seen, you know, it's very unusual 
especially where you don't have the workforce coming into work. And even where you do, um, we've seen some unions, um, you know, be fairly creative about this and, and make claims like, well, you can't have in-person meetings to discuss the union. And if you do, you're going to, you know, you're prioritizing keeping the union out over the health of your employees, which is obviously not a message that anyone wants to send in the midst of a union campaign. Uh, Molly, it looks like you have a question for me. <laughs> yeah, um, I was presenting a, a few weeks ago to employers, and one of the big things that they were focusing on is are just you know the switch to mail ballots and whether we anticipate that staying around potentially even after the crisis. Could you just address that briefly? Sure. I mean, I and, and Glenn, Brian, weigh in if you have thoughts. I don't think there's any way it's going to stick around to the way it is at present. I mean, basically, at this point, they're refusing to consider anything other than mail ballots. And the only reason that they're really able to do that, is, you know, are the safety concerns. I think once board agents are going back to work and once they're going back into the office and, you know, people are returning to work on a broader scale, I think, you know, the, the justification for mail ballots gets thinner and thinner. And, I, and so, you know, there have always been some mail ballot elections, but they've been in the minority that's clearly switched in this environment. But I, I would, assuming the pandemic continues to, you know, recede and, and people are returning to work and it's safe to do so, I, I would expect to see a return to, to manual elections. Another thing I've had clients ask about is why we don't have electronic voting at this point. And, so I know that's something that people would like to see the board potentially consider. Uh, Brian, it looks like you have a comment. Yeah, I mean, I, in my experience, um, I, I don't think that the folks who work at the National Labor Relations Board and the regional offices that conduct elections are particularly fond of mail ballots themselves, um, finding it to end up causing as many problems as it may uh, solve. Uh, Molly and I actually had a case now a number of years ago where uh, a determinative number of ballots were held by the Postal Service for days on end because they decided to bundle the mail for the National Labor Relations Board, hold it, and take it over in a in a in a lump drop off, which they managed uh, not to do until after the ballots were counted. Um, so, which caused litigation, which caused a relatively embarrassing decision uh, for the federal government, and you know, the the end result or some commentary afterwards by the people who worked at the board were was to the effect that this is the kind of stuff that always happens and why we don't like to do this. So, I, I concur, I think, with Kylan's assessment that I'm not really sure that the folks who work at the agency are dying to have mail ballots all the time once they feel comfortable uh, having in-person elections again. And with that, Brian, I will turn it over to you. Oh, look, I'm up. Um, so the uh, I was going to just talk about a few recent developments at the Labor Board, some decisions that have come down that, that have some effect on the organizing in particular. Uh, that we'll we'll be talking about a little bit. Uh, one of which just came down uh, a couple of weeks ago, involving the win out in Las Vegas, uh, this, uh, redefining what solicitation means. Uh, for those of you who don't know, it is generally um, unlawful uh, to stop employees from soliciting support for a union at work, um, so long as they're not. Um, engaged in that behavior during working time when they're supposed to be working instead. Now, there are some exceptions. There's, uh, there are some industries that have a little bit more leeway to to restrict solicitation uh, in certain areas, such as uh, healthcare and, and, and retail environments and whatnot. But the general rule is uh, that you can engage in your union uh, solicitation uh, at work anytime you want, so long as you're not supposed to be working. Um, and, but the employer can have a rule that says essentially working times for work. So let's let's keep it to non-working time like breaks, lunch, before and after work. Um, this though uh, uh, leads to the question of what solicitation is uh, sometimes. And uh, previous case law had said um, under the Obama administration that solicitation is really just asking somebody uh, to sign. A union authorization card, and it doesn't include uh, just talking about the union and encouraging uh, support for the union. 
the board recently, a couple weeks ago, uh, expanded the definition uh, and essentially said that um, an employer has the right to uh, prohibit their employees uh, from engaging in any kind of uh, solicitation uh, for union support, not just seeking uh, the signing of a card. Um, so, you know, you see the final bullet here says this is a potential game changer for employers. Uh, I think potential is an important word in that bullet because, for one thing, I've, I've had some clients ask me, should we revise our non-solicitation policy? And I would say most employers who have non-solicitation policies that have been reviewed by Labor Council um, already have policies that prohibit solicitation during working time uh, and don't define solicitation which means the policy doesn't need to change, uh, generally speaking, uh, but the ability to enforce it more broadly against more behavior uh, may be available to the employer. At the same time, for the most part, this does boil down to enforcement. Uh, and you know, I'm not sure that most employers uh, stop their employees from soliciting uh, support for various causes if it's a 30 second or one minute conversation that doesn't di distract anyone from actually doing work while the conversation is going on. And that's always what you have to be careful about is do you enforce your policy even handedly? Uh, and frankly, do you want to be an employer uh, that um, disciplines people for uh, every single thing you can possibly discipline them for? And so you always have to balance, I think, uh, legal risk, but also employee relations issues when you're thinking through these things. I know I have a now retired former partner of ours who used to be a big believer in not stopping employees unless it got really out of hand from communicating in the workplace about things like this, uh, if for no other reason than his view was you'd rather know what's going on than have it always have to happen somewhere else, and then you're surprised when the union uh, representation petition is filed. So lots of different things to consider, but the law has definitely changed on this issue. Um, then some prior developments that aren't quite as recent, but now seem in, in our current environment to perhaps be something worth remembering and that may be more even more important now. One is we have uh, gone back to the old rule when it comes to uh, company email where employers are permitted to tell employees that their work email is only for work uh, and that they can't engage in union activity uh, via their work email. Now, you can't have a rule that says you can't engage in union activity. It's got to be a broader based policy um, that, that prohibits things like non-work email or solicitation by email. Um, I think we, we have seen an uptick and will continue to see an uptick in workplace um, activity around work terms and conditions of employment, whether it is uh, safety related uh, stemming from the virus situation whether it is um, uh, racial or other uh, social justice issues that are uh, where people want action in the workplace uh, to, to address some of these things. Um, employees are more and more going to be using uh, their own work email or other uh, things like Slack, if you have these other instant messaging uh, systems at the workplace, to engage in all kinds of conversations uh, that will range from clearly work-related to clearly not work-related and everything in between. And so thinking through what your baseline policy is going to be on these things in advance before you're confronted with the question of, oh, that seems like an offensive thing or a problematic thing that I need to deal with, um, and not really knowing what your policy is or having to de develop a policy on the fly may um, cause you to have to make decisions or take actions that have more legal risk than if you'd thought about it in advance. Uh, the same goes with these, with um, regulating what people wear in the workplace. Now, this has been a, an issue since the dawn of time under labor law. But uh, what we're seeing now uh, is the new thing that people are wearing in the workplace are, are face masks, coverings, uh, which really, other than a few select industries and workplaces, was not an issue six months ago. And now it's an issue almost everywhere. And uh, one of the things that the, the Labor Board uh, addressed in this Walmart stores case you see here was not face masks, because that wasn't an issue in December of 2019, uh, but other uh, workplace apparel. And 
you know, it really is important as you see your employees coming back to work and you're thinking about um, having a face mask policy, whether it is people can bring their own and wear them if they want, people have to wear them and you'll supply them or everything in between, is when you think about what your policy is as far as what people have to do with respect to masks, also think about what your rules are for what people can do with their masks. From our perspective, I think the, the panelists here, who all four of us who are talking, it, it seems that the safest legal approach and probably the approach that uh, aligns best with safety concerns as well as um, enabling you to have a neutral policy that you can enforce uh, without having to make uh, your decisions more difficult than they have to be is if you're going to have people wear masks, provide the masks and um, tell people, uh, tell your employees that the masks are to be left alone. Um, that's probably not how you'd exactly write the policy, but uh, the point being that, you know, we're not going to uh, alter the masks. You're going to wear them as they're given to you and intended because that's the way to make sure that they provide the safety that they're supposed to provide. What we have been seeing is questions from employers who simply announced that people could wear their masks, if it, wear masks from home if they wanted, um, or, or even that they had to wear masks, but letting people bring their own is what happens when someone brings in a mask or puts on a mask that, that bears a particular uh, logo, whether it be a, a union uh, logo or a, uh, a logo that promotes a particular cause or position on something that someone may find controversial or even offensive, uh, and not really knowing what to do when they haven't thought about the issue beforehand. So that's our, our main point there. When it comes to the Boeing case uh, that you see there cited, um, that was a case where the board kind of reinvigorated the ability to have uh, workplace civility rules prohibiting things like bullying and um, harassment and uh, requiring people to be respectful in the workplace. Um, again, I would say the, the, the big development um, there, for the most part, was what you can have on the piece of paper. Um, what we're going to see uh, in in coming weeks and months, we think, uh, in, in, is figuring out how you're going to enforce uh, and police these policies. But certainly, again, it goes back to thinking about what your plans are for dealing with um, activity before you write the policy, making sure you follow the policy, the law with respect to the policy itself, but also understanding how you can um, enforce them. And when you do that, you know, you have to consider the fact that the National Labor Relations Act um, really, you know, provides employees with, with a lot of rights. And it's not just the rights you may think of when you think about labor relations law. It's not just the right to organize a union, although it is that right. It's not just the right to bargain collectively or go on strike uh, if you have a union, but also other concerted activities for mutual aid and protection. And that means, you know, actions by more than one employee or by one employee trying to uh, encourage others to engage in activity to uh, try to make their workplace a better place from their perspective, not necessarily from um, everybody's perspective. But if, if it's something that the employees are trying to do to, from their view, improve the workplace and they're doing it in a collective fashion, fashion they have the right to do that even if they're not represented by a union. And what we have seen uh, with a number of our clients since the um, pandemic really took hold and people uh, have become concerned about their health and safety more so perhaps than they were before and in workplaces where it wasn't an issue for them so much before is a real uptick in protected concerted activity even in non-union workplaces. Um, sometimes uh, it is in tandem with actual union organizing. Sometimes it, it appears not to be. It is simply uh, employees banding together, uh, whether after getting some advice from the outside or uh, developing it among themselves, but trying to band together to take uh, action to try to change things in the workplace. So we've seen um, we've seen uh, a group of employees. I had a client with a group of employees who refused to work and essentially conducted a sit-in over the fact uh, that they were being made to wear masks and they didn't want to wear the masks. <laughs> Um, we've seen uh, collective activity on the opposite, uh, in the opposite direction. Um, we've seen uh, people have read, I'm sure, who are listening out there, you've read stories about non-union workplaces, uh, people walking out or having demonstrations 
uh, over uh, a desire to have uh, what they term to be hazard pay. Um, the, we see more and more folks filing complaints with uh, OSHA over safety concerns, wh uh, whatever they may be. Uh, one of our manufacturing clients had a complaint filed over uh, the conditions of the employee locker room and showers, how much uh, space there was in there for people to, to do what they needed to do, as well as how clean it was kept, which, you know, I don't know that I've ever in 20 years seen a complaint about the size of a locker room or even the general cleanliness of a locker room uh, be raised to OSHA. But, you know, here we were, and it was uh, a concern that was at least worth considering given the social distancing requirements um, that they have. And Brian, just one thought that I have um, yeah. on this subject. So mutual aid is, uh, you know, the concern are terms and conditions of employment. And there is a, a fine line to be struck, especially when you look at sort of all the things that are happening in the world today, you know, are – uh, if if employees are banding together on what is a purely political message and one that doesn't relate to their terms and conditions, it may have uh, or may warrant a different approach from the employer. And I think, um, in all respects, if 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 there are subjects that your employees are talking about and that are important to them and that are creating this momentum for them to either group or band together, whether they are about terms and conditions of employment or whether they are about political objects or, or whether they are about social issues, I think, you, you know, every employer is well guided to sort of be on guard for all of those, be proactive where, where we can, and uh, be ahead of the game and not just think that it's just going to go away. Um, because these, the, you know, all these different mutual aid, um, uh, you know, approaches that employees take, whether it is, like you said, whether it's something that they came up with individually or whether it's something that was prompted by, you know, an outside influence, whether it's a, an influencing group or whether it's a union or whether it's, a, I forget the term we used to use, a UFO, which is some, uh, you know, a union front organization, that may be putting certain thoughts out there. I think, you know, you can end up with disruptions in your workplace. You're you're going to need to know how to respond to those. You're going to need to know what steps you can and can't take without uh, putting yourself in the crosshairs of an unfair labor practice. But most importantly, you know, keep your ear to the ground for what are the issues. How do you deal with them in advance to prevent the the situation from happening? It may just be that you can't absolutely prevent them. But certainly, if you're tuned into it and your people are tuned into it as well, you'll have a much better chance to engage the conversation that you need to engage, um, uh, you know, so that you can ad advance your workplace. Yeah, I think one other thing that we're seeing is, um, especially from employers who are non-union, who haven't had to deal with organizing activity in the past, or just questions about what employees um, kind of strike type activity is lawful or unlawful. I think a lot of employers just assume, oh, if they don't have a union, then they can't strike. Um, but, I mean, it's important to know that you know even non-union employees have a, have the ability to engage in strike type activity and they're and it's really with without a lot of limitation um you know it can't be intermittent so um you know it, if it's just a one off strike it's protected if it starts getting pattern here and there it might lose its protection if it starts getting to be too recognitional in certain circumstances it might be unprotected. So it's just imp important to realize that that a lot of the time this type of activity is, is completely lawful. And if you have questions about whether it's starting to get unlawful or just about that generally, um, th those are things that we're all here to help you with. Yeah, I'm just going to jump in real quick. I mean, we have seen a lot, less so lately, but particularly when the pandemic first started, we actually saw quite a bit of, of you know, 
unions encouraging non-union employees um, to exercise their their Section 7 rights and, you know, lots of non-union walkouts, including to the point of, you know, shutting down a facility, which is a pretty unprecedented and unusual development for a non-union client to have a production line shut out, shut down because of a an employee walkout over terms and conditions of employment. Uh, and so I think, you know, it, it's kind of an interesting, um, you know, it poses some interesting questions there, including, you know, I, I do, I have seen um, clients have employees basically realize, oh, we, we can actually do these things without having a union. Um, and then there are union employees at other unionized locations getting angry that they have a union because they didn't realize that they had the right to do that on their own without a union being present. So it is really interesting to see the, um, I mean, there's certainly been increased union organizing and, and that's not surprising in this environment, but the, the significant uptick in protected activity in, in a non-union setting that isn't related to organizing, I think, at least for us, is, is, is pretty remarkable and unusual. And if I could add, I mean, one, one sort of practice tip for everybody involved in labor relations um, and, and employee relations is make sure you're checking out the major websites for the various unions across our land. Um, oftentimes they're chock full of information that will be very helpful to you. And this slide, uh, or the prior slide, excuse me, we, we highlighted uh, something that was taken directly from the CWA's website. And they have on there sort of a fact sheet about how to engage in protected concerted activity that makes appeals to, um, and, and we'll talk about it later on as well, but uh, appeals to both unionized workforces and those that are not yet organized. So this stuff is out there. A lot of times it's very helpful for you to see it and to understand it and to, and to spend a little time hunting through the, the major union websites to find it. And I think one of the things is that, you know, I, one of the general rules I would say in labor relations is you, you, you most often hurt yourself if you're in a hurry as opposed to taking a little bit of time to deal with an issue. Um, it's not always the case, um, but for the most part, um, especially when you're dealing with non-union employees engaged in what may be protected concerted activity, the lines can be awfully fuzzy. The law can be awfully nuanced even for the most experienced labor lawyer. And, you know, barring a true emergency, it's often, you know, wisest to get, you know, call your designated labor relations or HR professional, in-house uh, lawyer, outside counsel, whoever it is, and have conversations about what the appropriate approach is. And and also, practically speaking, something may be unlawful, but, but or, or unprotected, I should say, by the law. Um, you know, generally speaking, a sit-in shutting down productions is not, is, is generally not protected activity. At the same time, if you have 200 people uh, refusing to work unless you give them a mask or let them take off their mask, whatever it may be, um, them, their activity, even if it's unprotected, you know, practically speaking, is, are you really going to tell them all they're terminated as a result of behavior that you may think is unprotected if you have no real alternative to get the, the production lines up and running? So, you know, for really in the end, you know, communication and trying to have some uh, basic level of respect for what employees are perceiving and feeling and communicating with them about those issues uh, from your business perspective, but also from a human perspective, is usually the foundation for, for having a resolution to the problem um, before you have to go some other route. Um, the... This next slide, you know, I'll, I won't keep up here too long. Uh, it's really just kind of a few bullets on, so what do we see as really motivating some union organizing activity in these particular circumstances? And uh, it's really flows from what you've seen from the beginning of this presentation, right? That you saw the survey results about what employees are looking for uh, in, in our new circumstances, particularly with, with the pandemic and the virus. Um, and you also see uh, what what we've experienced in non-union workplaces, whether a union is around or not, uh, trying to organize. And and so I think it all pretty clearly leads to 
seeing that if people feel like they need a third party, a union, to represent them to try to achieve the things you see on the screen here, you know, better safety, um, protection for somebody who feels like they have raised safety issues and has been retaliated against, feels like a whistleblower. Um, so, you know, unfair discipline from their perspective. Uh, people who feel like they are, should be entitled to additional pay because they're risking contracting the virus while other people are not. Uh, people wanting to have more leave, what paid obviously preferably, but even unpaid protected leave if they've been ordered to self-isolate, even if they don't actually have the virus, if they are in a um, high-risk category and feel like they would be more comfortable staying at home. Um, and, you know, in the last few weeks, this high, uh, e even more heightened uh, attention being paid uh, to equality and justice issues in society more broadly, but also in the workplace. Uh, those issues have long been um, uh, an, an issue around which unions can organize uh, and, and can help people try to achieve um, what they feel is justice in the workplace. So, you know, what really can you do about all this? I mean, I'd, I'd really point you to, um, as much as anything, communication with your employees about what you're doing, why you're doing it, why it is important to the success of the business, um, what makes your business successful and how those employees contribute to it so they can understand these rules that you're uh, now newly applying, per perhaps, are important to the combined success of the workforce and uh, the employer is, is the bottom line fundamental key thing. But all these other things, you know, make sure you understand your state and local laws and executive orders. Um, you know, em employees as well as unions themselves uh, certainly can leverage an employer's failure to follow uh, these executive orders and ordinances. Um, make sure you understand that your supervisors are the frontline uh, communicators with your employees, uh, and, and they need to be equipped with the tools to uh, explain what's going on to properly enforce the rules in a fair uh, and, and rational manner. Um, make sure you're proactive, you know. I mean, you should be looking to hear from your employees, uh, communicating with your employees, uh, finding out what their issues are before it becomes a, a, a huge inflection point and, and blows up into something bigger uh, than you can now control. Um, training is more important than ever now on both safe uh, workplace practices for, for management and supervisors, as well as the employees, but also you see tips, which I think many of you have probably seen, um, you know, no threats, no interrogation, no promises, no spying. Those are all unlawful things, generally speaking, with respect to protected concerted activity and unionization. Um, training your folks on how to engage in positive employee relations. Um, it, it, you know, it's, it, to some extent, the, the things you need to do today are no different than the things you've always needed to do from a big picture standpoint. Um, it's just you have to apply them in new, in new ways and in new, uh, new circumstances. Um, so, you know, uh, Kylan, you have a little uh, quick comment on the technology uh, point? Yes, thank you. I mean, so one thing I, I did want to caution people on that we've seen is in certain industries where historically, an employer hasn't used text messaging or email or any other sort of electronic uh, communication with employees, uh, you know, if you then find yourself facing an organizing effort and employees aren't coming into work, um, you, you do become significantly hamstrung in your ability to communicate with them. So to the extent that at present you don't use any methods along those lines to communicate with employees, you know, I think it's important to at least consider whether you should be in different ways that you would be able to so that you, you know, you aren't caught off guard and, and particularly since going forward, there's no telling, you know, how much more remote working and those types of practices are going to become increasingly common, which would also, you know, really validate the need to communicate with employees and in ways other than face to face. And so, you know, we do think something that people can do right now or companies can do right now is to just ensure that they, even if they don't want to use them all the time, that they have methods in place to do that. And I think, um, you know, one other, a couple other points, and, and also I want to answer a question or two that's come in here. Um, 
you know, many of the things that that employees are really frustrated or worried or anxious about right now, uh, particularly with respect to the COVID-19 situation, um, you know, there are things they want addressed uh, yesterday, um, not even tomorrow, much less six months from now, right? You know, if you want people to be socially distant in the workplace, if you want to have uh, extra time off, if you want to have masks, um, it doesn't really do any good if the employer eventually agrees to do all those things in 2021. Um, I mean, I, guess, I suppose be- better late than never, but th- these are urgent issues from the employee's perspective. And, you know, quite quite candidly, um, whatever anyone's view is on the process of organizing and bargaining, uh, usually organizing a new union, getting it in the workplace and getting things changed is not a, is not something that happens tomorrow. Um, even with a quick election process, it's not going to happen anywhere close to that quickly. And so it re- these really are things that it, it seems to me employers uh, have a good message as to why a union is not really the solution to these particular problems. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is, if the employer is not providing either a solution or good information about why the requested solution is not workable, um, employees may turn to a union nevertheless, because uh, a union is, is, from their perspective, perhaps better than nothing uh, to get them to feel as though their voice is heard. Um, one of the questions we had here was just to um, repeat what TIPS and, and PER means on the slide there. So uh, TIP stands for Threats, Interrogation, Promises, and Spying, or Surveillance, depending on who you are. Um, both meaning the same thing. And generally speaking, you cannot threaten people for engaging in uh, protected activity under the labor laws. You can't promise them things. That's the P for um, not engaging in that type of activity. And then you can't interrogate people or question them about their protected activity. Uh, And you can't spy on people uh, and their protected activity that they're engaging in. There's a lot of nuance to that, but that's a whole other training that would take its own own, uh, hour or more. Uh, positive employee relations is what we mean by PER. So really training your folks on how it is that you build the right kind of workplace where folks don't feel like they need to go somewhere else, whether it's OSHA or a union or some some government agency to the media, whoever it may be, but uh, really look to turn uh, in, internally to their supervisors and managers to help them solve their workplace problems because they know that you will listen to them, give them a fair and respectful hearing, and help them. Um, with that said, we're going to transition uh, more away from the non-union sector to the already unionized sector, and I'm going to pass the baton to Glenn. But before I do, uh, I do have the CLE code for those of you who need your continuing legal education uh, for this session. So everybody uh, get ready with your pens and, and paper or typewriters as it is. The code is SS1446. So that's SS as in Seifarth Shaw, 1446. All right, Glenn, you want to take it from here? Thanks, Brian. Yeah, moving on to really one of the most fun areas that we get to deal with in terms of our representation is the is the bargaining side. And uh, the bargaining side in, includes, you know, hopefully reaching agreement, and sometimes it includes uh, disagreeing. And, and we're going to deal with both of those subjects here as we uh, as we move this forward. Um, right now, we have um, as much as I've seen in 30 years, um, some really um, contrasting and competing interests. Um, I think ac- across the country, you see more employers who are in. Um, very difficult financial position than I can recall at any point in time during my practice experience. At the same time, we're seeing from unions and employees that there are a host of concerns out there, and we've talked about many of them in the organizing uh, uh, context, and it's similar here in the bargaining context. So I think people are going to be raising their voice. I think unions are going to be speaking out on behalf of their employees and members, and I think they're they're going to be asking for certain things. But to me, one of the most interesting things that we're going to see play out is, you know, with so many businesses in such a struggling place, how do we, you know, it's all well and good that, that 
that, that a union is asking for the sun, the moon, and the stars, some of us think sometimes, or that it's asking for um, items that are going to create significant expenses. But if the bottom line isn't there from the employer, you know, what is it that you can really do about it? And um, what we're going to see as we, you know, move ahead is, is I think, a very difficult time. And hopefully there's going to be a time where the employers and, and unions can understand that, you know, sometimes there's going to be a little bit of retrenchment. Uh, sometimes there's going to be some job losses, but the ultimate goal in a productive relationship between a union and a company and most importantly the employees as well is you know how do you help to grow that business back to its healthy spot and it really does take two to tango on that front Molly hi I was on mute sorry <laughs> Um, on this slide, we are um, just covering, I think, the industries that are most uh, affected that tend to be for the private sector more unionized than most. Um, I don't think that this is a surprise to many of you to see this list, um, given everything that's happened. But these are the industries that were affected really early um, in the crisis, and um, f for almost all of them except for um, air and rail travel and healthcare, they experienced really significant early layoffs um, and uh, partial closures. And as we move through time, I think we're starting to see more permanent closures in some of these spaces. And then for air and rail, um, I think everybody's expecting to see more layoffs coming um, or layoffs to start to come in October after the um, their CARES funding that was conditioned um, arguably on no furloughs um, until then um, start to happen. Then also I think health care is interesting. I mean, early on I think everybody just assumed as lay people, um, you know, they were so integral to what was going on, how could they be struggling? But with all of the elective services being shut down, healthcare has been greatly affected and we're just starting to see in the news um, over the past couple of weeks how, how hospitals have been affected and the layoffs happening there. So with that, um, you know, changes in the workforce, layoffs, closures, comes a lot of bargaining obligations. So I just want to talk, talk you through some of the very basics of the law on this um, over the next few slides. So for unionized employers with contracts, um, many of our clients, oops, sorry, many of our clients, um, you know, when this all started happening in March, had, we're in the middle of contracts. So they're in a situation where their contract says what they can and can't do um, largely, and you're in the middle of it. So if your contract doesn't address what you need to do, how do you handle that? Um, now, um, under the NLRA and most collective bargaining agreements, um, there's generally no obligation or even ability to engage in midterm bargaining unless both parties agree to do so. So, um, you know, employers um, and unions generally um, – you know, look to their to their contract language um, unless they can agree to bargain in those cases. And in many cases, I think all four of us saw employers and unions doing just that to address the situations. Um, they were bargaining um, in side letters and MOUs to to work together collaboratively to address the situation. Um, we saw lots of side letters on things like COVID-19 related leave, benefits while folks are on leave, you know, things like that. Um, in other cases, some employers were just left to their contract language. Um, and when that happens, you just follow your contract language. So for example, let me give you a specific example and one that comes up all the time. If you need to make layoffs because you need to reduce your workforce or you need to close um, temporarily, then and you're in the middle of a contract, most CBAs generally um, allow for a layoff. Um, you need to have the contract language to do that. Um, and then uh, 
you know, prescribe how you, the order of layoff, how, how the layoff would work. Um, so we had clients that, that just did that. Um, in other cases um, where there were issues, um, you know, associated with various contract changes that needed to be made and the employer couldn't get the union to sit down with them, um, the employer still might have the ability to make changes it needs to keep the business afloat, um, you know, or to really address significant changes in the business or, or like things like customer demand without bargaining with the union and just unilaterally do it, but it's extremely limited. Um, so just walking through a specific example on this, um, if a client had a need, you know, to drastically change their shifts, um, the workplace shifts in a way that's different than, than what's called for in the collective bargaining agreement. So I think of maybe a warehouse situation where all of a sudden you had a huge influx of customer demand, needed um, employees to be working, but needed them to be working differently at different times, um, and in some cases with fewer, fewer people for safety measures. Um, how do you go about doing that if the union won't sit down with you? Well, Oftentimes, you can rely on a management rights clause, but if your management rights clause isn't strong enough, then you might need to look at um, exceptions for just unilateral Im implementation. And this is generally, um, you know, what we call as labor lawyers the exigent circumstances exception. And it is very, very rare that it can be used. Um, but it was starting to come up so frequently in March that the NLRB actually issued a memo on this. Peter Robb, the general counsel of the NLRB, set forth um, – some cases that address situations where employers need to make unilateral changes in times that are like this. And that memo generally goes through uh, several cases that deal with weather-related situations, hurricanes, ice, uh, ice storms, um, you know, financial shocks to certain industries, things that happened during 9-11 and what employers can and can't do. And the cases are kind of all over the map. Um, I think the case that, that I have found most help, helpful through all of this is called RBE Electronics, and it kind of sets forth the test. And it's a case from the NLRB in the mid-1990s. And essentially the test is, you know, an employer can implement without bargaining with the union um, in times where there are exigencies, I cannot say that word, um, and that's when time is of the essence, when um, the employer must take prompt action, where the employer can prove um, that the changes that it needs to make are actually compelled by the situation. Um, where the situation is caused by external events beyond the employer's control and where it's not reasonably foreseeable. So it's a really limited exception. And while maybe what was going on at the beginning of COVID-19 fell into that, and, and maybe even things do now if you can't really tell what's going to happen, um, it's it, you really need to be careful about making changes um, without bargaining with the union if you don't have the ability to do so in your contract. Okay. I do think it's going to be interesting to see how this all plays out, um, especially if we have a change to a Democratic board, you know, next year as some of the 8A5 unilateral change ULPs that might come out of this get decided. Um, so we, uh, you know, I'll all we can really do is do our best and try and manage our businesses during this time. And I think that's, you know, what we're, we're largely advising clients, you know, to do, but, but you really need to realize that there's some risk here and to be pretty careful. Okay. Um, now, even if you can unilaterally change, um, or you decided to engage in decisional bargaining, um, there's still an obligation to engage in effects bargaining. And this is one of the things that I've had come up repeatedly with clients 
which I think as labor lawyers, we're so ingrained, it's so ingrained in our head, there's two types of bargaining. Do you have the right to, to do it? Um, and if you have the right, then what happens afterwards? You know, do you have the right to do it as the decisional bargaining obligation? What happens afterwards is the effects bargaining obligation. And under the National Labor Relations Act, that dichotomy exists. Um, and I think a lot of clients forget about the effects side of it. So even if you have the ability to do something um, legally or through your contract, you, you still, under the NLRA, have an obligation to bargain over effects. I think clients find that surprising because they think in a contract situation, okay, we've laid off um, – folks, our contract is really clear about what happens um, during a layoff. Why do we still need to engage in effects bargaining? Well, you need to do so if, if the union wants to talk about something. So if they request it after you've announced that, that you're going to do a layoff, for example, then you need to sit down and bargain with them. Now, how that really plays out is ideally what you would do is if you need to um, – lay folks off, you'd give the union an advance notice of that, let them know what's happening when the layoff's going to occur, um, how many people are affected, um, and make sure that that's given in writing. And then if the union turns around and requests bargaining over things like benefits on a lay on while folks are on layoff, then you'd sit down and talk with them. Ideally, you'd have those conversations before you actually implement your decision or your layoff. Um, but the key here is just to talk with the union and bargain with them um, and give them a meaningful opportunity to, um, for the parties to come to agreement on, on what the union's asking for. You can implement without having effects bargaining completely um, done, um, and you just need to make sure that you adhere to your obligation to bargain in good faith. Listen to what the union wants. Um, have a discussion. If you can agree to it, great. If you can't, um, th there's no ability for the union to bargain to impasse before that before you actually implement on the effect side. So those are the that's the basics of um, um, you know kind of what happens when you are in midterm contracts, um, and the effects also go to um, expired and expiring contracts too, which is the next slide here. So I know some of our clients are getting um, – I have one that's coming up um, – actually, it just happened at the end of May um, with an expired contract, and there were a lot of questions, okay, how, how, do, how do we go about doing this? How can we possibly bargain in person? Um, and we've been working on trying to figure out how to bargain remotely. We certainly have clients who are doing it. Um, sometimes um, either side is hesitant to do so for privacy reasons. There are definitely services available that can help mitigate some of those concerns. Um, and so there are ways to do it. I, I also have one client who's regularly meeting with the union in a socially distanced fashion that sometimes is hard to do if you've got a large bargaining team on either side. Um, but it's possible. Um, in other cases, um, you know, one side or the other might want delays. So, for example, if an employer is really going through a financial uh, hardship and the union thinks that things might get better quickly, we're seeing unions drag things out. Um, definitely, they're trying to insist on uh, um, extensions in those circumstances so that they can keep – their, their pay rates and benefits at the same level. Um, so there's a lot of that going on. Um, and then we have some clients who, you know, there's just nothing to be done and contracts are expiring. Now, can you make changes during that um, after expiration? You're kind of back into the realm of what I was discussing during midterm bargaining if you um, – uh, can't get the union to come to the table and bargain and you don't have the ability under your contract to make the change, you're back into kind of that exigent circumstances analysis. Um, generally, management rights clauses cause um, our waivers and they fall off um, once your contract expires. So uh, you really need to be careful about making unilateral changes in that context and, and kind of go back to that Peter Robb memo and start thinking about how that how, how those cases might affect the situation. All right, Glenn, I think I'm turning it over to you. Sure. And on, on that issue of the expired versus expiring contracts and 
it, it does really point out, in some instances, the uh, the disparity between what employers may need and and what the unions may want. Um, you know, there are there are many instances going on right now where um, it, it would be extremely difficult for a union to to head to the table right now and hear the things that an employer has to say, knowing that the economic times are so bad. So we do end up with quite often a lot of unions seeking delays. Um, you know, and, and, and we certainly understand that and why they would want to do that. But at the same time, you know, there has to be this longer focus on what you actually need. In terms of getting into some of the nitty-gritty of the bargaining issues that we see um, as we, uh, uh, you know, sort of try to run through this section on, on all the different bargaining topics, um, I still think you're going to have a lot more discussion about layoffs and furloughs. You're going to have some employers who continue to to have situations arise where they're going to have to trim their workforce in certain areas. Um, order of recall is, is one where I think we have to try to identify mutual interests with the, with the unions out there. Um, we might not want to bring folks back in exactly the way that's required under the collective bargaining agreement, but clearly... The unions also want their workers back at work, um, you know, with, with very few exceptions. And, um, you know, this is going to be, it's about getting the dues money flowing as well. I mean, uh, for a lot of folks who are on layoff, if that, that'll, that'll limit the amount of dues. And if we can get the members back in and working in a smart way that makes sense for the employer, I think there's a way to find, again, a mutual interest between the union and the company on that. Um, we're going to have to deal with this issue of willingness to, to return, you know, or ability to return, or identifying persons who have uh, underlying conditions or who are more susceptible to the virus. Um, and frankly, you know, trying to figure out some way to discern which of those are actually accurate and should be addressed versus which of them are really a function of the um, government subsidies through the um, uh, through the unemployment uh, insurance uh, payments, whether or not that is just the reason that's really underlying it. Another thing to look at it, in terms of a, of, a, of a workforce that's been cut down is voluntary buyouts is something that employers ought to be thinking. And again, if you have a unionized workforce, you're going to have to do that in conjunction with, with your union to figure out how to do it, but it may make sense. Um, I know we had a, a, a years ago Back in 2009, 2010, we had a very successful, um, uh, it was unfortunate, but it was successful layoff for a very large employer in the New York area. Um, we were able to work with the union to identify a way to have some voluntary buyouts. It helped to soften the blow, and ever since then, we've been working to build that workforce back up through the efforts that the company has made to expand its market and grow its market, and we've been able to do so. And today, we're nearly double the size that we were back in 2009, 2010, when we had to do all those layoffs. The other thing is um, we're going to have to spend some time dealing with this issue of there has been this incentive pay. I know it's been mentioned a number of, of times, and these enhancements that were added in, I, 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 I certainly believe that we're going to have to continue bargaining about them, and we're going to be hearing more and more from the unions on the front of uh, you know items that are needed in terms of safety and whatnot, and and whatnot. Um, when I go to the next slide, there's a couple of things that really have jumped off the page in terms of concession bargaining, and I want to focus on two different sectors. Healthcare is one. We've seen national proposals on healthcare that talk about freezing wages, that talk about um, eliminating 401k contributions for the term of an agreement. Uh, that talk about peeling back all these COVID-19 enhancements that we're dealing with before. And for retailers, we're, we're seeing um, some really heavy-duty discussions with uh, where they have unions, uh, you know, and, and addressing this issue of, you know, we're just not selling anymore. What's going to happen to the brick and mortar? And the brick and mortar, again, has been, it's been complicated not only – by what's happened with COVID-19, but also what's happened in some of the bigger cities in terms of, of uh, the amount of damage that's taken place and how that's going to be addressed. And just if it prolongs the closings that have already existed due to the virus, then what next is that going to mean for retailers and where are they going to move on the brick-and-mortar front? So I think 
you know, those to me are the ones that you're going to see the greatest amount of concession bargaining. I, I, I didn't put a slide in here. We didn't put a slide in here on the opposite end of the spectrum. But, you know, there are also employers who are expanding. There are employers who are doing more business. And I think one of the things you're going to have to look at there is what does that generally mean for their workforce and how is that going to be addressed and how are you going to come to understand that there may be more opportunities and a, and a, and a better supply of money to, that the other side, the union, is going to be looking for. Leaves, I mean, this is obviously every traditional labor lawyer's favorite topic is trying to figure out the complexities of all the leaves in the world, and it just got about a thousand times more complicated in my perspective. But I, I think there's going to be considerable discussion, bargaining, and again, hoping to try to find some mutual ground on areas that relate to paid leave, unpaid leaves for folks who just don't want to return to work yet, you know, voluntary leaves of absence for people who want to take some time off as well and, and stay out of the workplace at the moment, um, how this impacts seniority and pay and benefits, you know, what things are going to be cut off. I know a lot of employers, um, and, and this was, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the non-union sector just did so in terms of made this decision to provide benefits during the, uh, during the period of any furlough or layoff. I know also on the union side, of, of the world, we had unions who were seeking to, for employers to continue those benefits. I think it's a subject that's going to have to be dealt with, um, you know, significant amount of time in, as in the in the coming weeks and months, and really throughout the balance of 2012. Brian, did you have a thought? Yeah, you know, with with all these things you're talking about that are what I would call nice things that employers may have an opportunity to do, whether it's incentive pay or leaves of absence, extra paid leave, extra unpaid leave. One of the things I've seen a fair bit of is in the rush to do a lot of these things, employers um, simply implementing good things and assuming <clears throat> because the union doesn't complain that they didn't really have an obligation to bargain over it. Um, but what they may find out is if they didn't bargain over it in the first place, and most importantly, in my view, get some kind of agreement, if you can, that it's temporary, if that's what you envision, um, you're going to find out that the union raises the right to bargain when it's time for you to say, well, these things we did to get us through a particular period, we're now going to roll back. Um, you know, the union's not going to say okay to that as easily as they, they did to the rolling it out on the, on the opposite end. So it really is, I think, important to to think through uh, working with the union and really establishing and writing, ideally, the parameters around some of these things that you're doing if you don't intend for them to last indefinitely. Agreed. And I, and I think when you put something down on paper, I also think you start to think about the other side of the equation a little bit more. I know during some of the COVID-19-related bargaining that I did, um, we were at first dealing with the union's requests for various midterm modifications. And in the process of identifying those, we came up with some considerations that the employer wanted as well. And I think if we had just handled them as sort of one-offs, as you're suggesting, it, it probably wouldn't have gone that way. But once we started putting it down on paper and we could see what the give and the take was, it, it, and also putting an expiration date on it for, for both sides, um, it, did, it definitely made sense. In terms of other bargaining issues, and I, don't, I do want to leave some time for our questions at the end. We have about 12 minutes left. Um, the sick leave one is an interesting one uh, as well. Again, it gets more and more complicated um, in New York. Is there's open questions about uh, about whether or not you can uh, enter into an agreement to sort of waive uh, the sick leave requirements specifically and whether you can uh, incorporate that waiver because you have um, other benefits in your contract. So that area continues to be complicated. Likewise, if your workforce has been out for four or five months, you know, and that's what it's really going to be for some folks by the time they get back, you know, certainly three months, um, hopefully not four or five. But, you know, how do you deal with the fact that you have all this vacation time that people haven't taken 
Um, granted, there have been a lot of people who have been off. If you didn't have a burn-off mechanism that was agreed to with the union beforehand, what are you going to do with putting these vacations back on the calendar? How are you going to equitably address that? How are you going to reach a deal with the union? Um, finally, you know, we covered many of these earlier on as well, cleaning practices, child care. These are just some more of them before I turn it back over to Molly. I know she's got some items coming up for you as well. Yeah, so state and local laws, I, a couple of you are asking about that on the chat. Um, the key here is to really, um, wherever you're operating, make sure that you check all of your governor's orders and also anything that might have been passed by your city council <clears throat> or your county councils. They um, can sometimes limit what you can and can't do in your CBA. In Washington State, for example, Governor Inslee issued an emergency order that basically says, um, you know, at-risk employees or high, uh, you know, employees that are subject to higher risk, if if their their only option to be accommodated is to go on to a leave, they've got a priority right to recall from their leave. And the governor, in his order, he actually said. Um, you know, uh, pursuant to criminal penalties, any employers and unions who follow their bargaining agreement over this order, it it it's unlawful and you can't do it. Um, that's, I think, the most direct statement like that that I've seen from any of the state and local orders that I have seen. But there are definitely orders out there that it, LA in particular comes to mind where there are rules around how you lay off and, and recall employees and you just want to make sure that you understand what those are and are really thinking about um, how you follow that in the context of your CBA and talking with your union about it. Um, at least here on the West Coast, these raids major, well, anywhere they, they raise preemption issues, can a state and local law preempt federal labor law? On the West Coast, um, the answer to that is largely no from the Ninth Circuit right now. So you have to be really careful. Um, in other circuits, you might have a little bit more leeway to follow your bargaining agreement, but it, it's really important to look at those. In situations where, where the laws provide more generous benefits, Glenn just mentioned waivers. Sometimes these laws are waivable under the laws themselves. So you want to make sure um, to look at your bargaining agreement to see if there's there's the potential for a waiver. But generally, um, these laws are additive to your bargaining agreement. That's how they're written. Okay. Cool. I think we've largely talked about a lot of this in the, the organizing context. Um, you know, we're just, again, even in unionized workforces, you're seeing more of, uh, more of what we were talking about in the non-union workforces. I'm just going to skip over this so we can catch up here and leave some time for um, questions. Right. And this was an interesting one on mutual aid. And, again, the, the text here is very similar to what we covered in the non-union setting and the organizing setting. But the letter here involves the, the Med Orchestra. It's fairly microscopic print. But it's a, essentially a list of demands that were are, are linked to um, you know the um, the the protests, the the racial and um, and and diversity issues that have arisen um, in today's you know environment. And again, this is this is a group of folks who are banding together to put these issues front and center. Uh, maybe some of these are considered political, but overall, again, it's something that I think the employer is obviously going to have to address and identify, but it just is, a, is an illustration for you from very current. I think this is just a, a, a text or a post from just a, a couple days ago that, that really illustrates what's happening out there. <clears throat> Union information request. Kylan, were you going to take this one or was I? Sure. Yeah, no, I can take this. Um, so I'll, I'll be as brief as possible again so that we can leave some time for questions. But, you know, unsurprisingly, we've been getting a lot of or seeing a lot of un uh, information requests from the union related to COVID and, you know, whether it's layoffs or returning to work, they've, you know, asking about the different protocols and things that are being put in place. 
um, to the extent that an employer is receiving a government stimulus or PPP loan, they've, you know, we've seen a lot of requests around how uh, the company plans to use that money, requests about the employer's financial condition, uh, particularly where the employer has asked to cut pay or do anything of that nature. Um, and then probably, at least from my perspective, the one that's been the most problematic or <laughs> created the most heartburn is a lot of unions have sent very specific requests wanting to know exactly who um, has been identified as having COVID and anyone that they've come into contact with basically taking the position that they want to do their own contact tracing. Um, there are a lot of, you know, just not enough time on this call, but we'd be happy to answer later offline. You know, there's a lot of different ADA concerns around identifying specific people with a medical condition um, and, and different reasons that, you know, you might not want to provide that level of information to the union, but even if there are valid reasons not to provide it, you know, you still have to work with the union to kind of accommodate their concerns and, and provide them enough information, um, you know, so that they're satisfied with what, you know, what your response is, you know, if you want to avoid an, an unfair labor practice charge, um, you know, I, I will say, you know, there hasn't been a COVID specific case, but there is case law out there, uh, John's Mansville, Mansville Hospital being one that supports the idea that you do not have to identify a specific employee who has a medical condition. And again, for ADA reasons, um, in general, we would recommend that you not do so. But we are seeing a lot of requests from the union along these lines, as well as, again, you know, almost them doing their own contact tracing efforts. I will say anecdotally, uh, what has worked for me when we face these kinds of requests is just basically laying out to the union everything that we are already doing on that front to ensure them and to make them feel comfortable that we're keeping people safe and, you know, knock on wood, it's happened five or six times thus far every single time the union has said, okay, that works, and it hasn't continued to be an issue. But you do have to take these information requests seriously. They are relevant to the union's, you know, bargaining representative duties. And, you know, we, I have yet to see, um, and someone else on this call I'm sure has, but I personally have yet to see an information request where it wasn't relevant and we didn't have an obligation to respond and or accommodate the union. And with that, I think we open it up for questions. One of the earlier questions that came across was if we had any statistics or numbers about restaurants and drinking in bars and whether or not, um, I, I think the question was aligned with whether or not people were looking forward to return that. I mean, you can take a survey of the four speakers on this presentation, and I think you'll find that the answer is yes. I think people largely are. It's certainly the sentiment. I'm, I mean, I live in New Jersey. I work in New York, which are two of the most heavily um, locked down areas uh, uh, around the country. You know, since this thing got started, and I do say, I feel like there's a there's an enormous pent up demand there. I think it's going to be a little bit difficult to meet some of that demand because of the fact that there's going to be at least initially, you know, first there's going to be outdoor outdoor dining, and that takes effect in New Jersey next week. And then, in, you know, well, you're going to move indoors, but it's going to be probably reduced capacity for some limited amount of time. But I do feel like there's a lot of pent-up demand. We had another question just come in. Um, the question is, if the company provides uniforms and masks, can they tell employees not to wear union apparel? Um, so... Again, that gets back to that Walmart case that, that Brian was talking about earlier. Brian, I don't know if you want to address it or you want me to. Go ahead. So I think the answer is when it comes to the masks, we our, our overarching recommendation is that you can make a, a policy and probably need to make a policy for both the use of masks and also potentially for keeping them standardized is I think what we should sort of recommend. What, what that ignores is that people can still express most frequently their Section 7 rights. Now, the Walmart case that we discussed from December, it does give an employer some greater rights in, a, in, the, in the context of an, uh, you know, customer-facing positions than they previously had under the Obama administration's board. But again, you, you have to be careful if the person is, is not exposed, generally speaking, to the public, is not in a customer-facing position, 
there are definitely some um, caveats that you have to be aware of and, and, and generally permitting some level of uh, uh, of expressing, you know, sympathies for or against the union. There's another question about mandated paid sick leave, and I'm not sure what state that's referring to. But um, by and large, most of them do have a carve-out um, that, that permits um, an employer to uh, enter into a, an agreement with a union that recognizes that um, they're an exception to the policy, although that is not true in every state for sure. At present, we're not a 1,000% sure what New York State means with regard to the sick leave. I don't know if anybody else wants to comment on their particular part of the world. Yeah, I would say on the West Coast and the West Coast states and city ordinances, um, other than California State, there generally are not carve-outs um, for even CBA waivers, so you don't even have the ability to try and waive uh, in the majority of jurisdictions on the West Coast right now. So we were happy that we could get a few questions in. Sorry we didn't leave some more time, but uh, we are coming up on the time to close our program. We just have a slide here about our Labor Management Relations Practice Group, which we're all happy members of. Um, you know, we're certainly here for you and have a variety of different services. Also, one of the things we wanted to point you to is the various CIFAR COVID-19 resources that exist. If you're not on the, some of these mailing lists, you, you should be. They've, they've been great. They've received rave reviews. We've had you know more than 100 attorneys across the firm working on a lot of these materials, which have been going out, really multiples of them on a daily basis. Um, with that, one final thank you from all of us to all of you that attended. Um, we really had a great turnout, and, and uh, we really appreciate you being here and hope this was a helpful webinar for you. Thanks very much. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you for attending.